Well, good morning, church. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Joshua, chapter 2, as you're turning there, just a couple things I want to make mention of. You'll hear about them again at the end of the service. Just want to make sure we don't uh, forget any of them. If you are uh, a senior adult, we're just categorizing that as 60 plus. Some of you might be offended by that. I'm sorry. But we are having, now you won't be offended because we're having a free lunch for you right after the service, all right? So we're going to have our legacy banquet right over at our Family Life Center, right at the conclusion of our service. We'd love for you to come and be a part of that, talking about uh, just some different things for senior adult ministry. We just want to honor you, so thankful for you. want to make sure that we're ministering uh, to you, so please be a part of that lunch. Also, we announced it last week, but next week at the conclusion of both of our services, we're going to have a pretty quick special called business meeting. So according to our bylaws, uh, in order to uh, give someone the title of pastor, they have to be voted on by the church. Our personnel team has put forward um, Carlos Gerke. If you remember last fall, we ordained him, said that we saw that he had, fits the qualifications of a pastor, but we are a congregationally governed church as Southern Baptists. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, and that means all of us have a voice, so we need to, according to our bylaws, vote to affirm that call. Um, he's already fulfilling the role, but we want to make sure he'll be then known as our pastor of young adults and groups. So be praying for him and be ready for that special called business meeting next week. Yeah, there you go. We love Carlo, and we hope that we don't lose him to the chosen because he kind of looks like Jesus right now. So... <laughs> Given this title, keep him around a little longer, all right? But anyway, I hope you've made your way to the book of Joshua, chapter 2, and let's talk about where we're going with this whole series. As we walk through the book of Joshua, we're going to be doing this all through, uh, from now through the entirety of the summer, and really we talked about last week how God gave Joshua this call. Back in Genesis chapter 12, he had promised Abraham that he'd give him this land flowing with milk and only this land that he was going to show him, the promised land, Canaan. And now, five, six hundred years later, they're on the precipice of entering the promised land. Moses, after he had led the Israelites out of Egypt, he had sent 12 spies into the promised land. Forty years previously, those 12 spies came back, two of them, Joshua and Caleb said, let's go, let's go take this land that God has promised. But 10 of them said, no, you don't understand, there's giants in the land, it's really scary, let's just hang out in the desert, let's just hang out in the wilderness. And we know the Israelites were disobedient, they listened to the, to the majority, those 10 spies, and so God punished them. So for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. Then God shows up after Moses passed away. He shows up to Joshua. He says, I'm going to have you lead my people. If you remember, he tells him, be strong and courageous. And this is a theme throughout Joshua. We'll see again and again, be strong and courageous. But remember, it's not what you think. It's not be strong and courageous in battle. That's not what God says. God says, be strong and courageous in following my word. You see, yes, the Israelites are taking on the promised land, but God is much more concerned with the sin in Joshua's heart, in the hearts of the Israelites, and he is the enemies in the promised land. And for each and every one of us, when God talks about having strength and courage, the strength and courage that we need is to surrender ourselves to him and to follow his word. Amen. So God tells Joshua this. He gathers the Israelites together and says, we're going to go and we're going to enter into the promised land. Well, here we see in chapter 2 a little bit of a, man, a do-over. They sent 12 spies into the promised land back in Numbers. Now he's only going to send two spies into the promised land here in Joshua chapter 2, and we'll see this interesting story of what transpires. So if you would please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to look at the entirety of chapter 2 this morning. We're going to, only going to read the first seven verses together. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible Translation, and this is what God's Word says. Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove, saying, go, Scout the land, especially Jericho. So they left, and they came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, 
Some of the Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab and said, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, for they came to investigate the entire land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So she said, Yes, the men did come to me, but I didn't know where they were from. At nightfall, when the city gate was about to close, the men went out. And I don't know where they were going. Chased after them quickly, and you can catch up with them. But she did not take them up to the roof. Oh, but excuse me, but she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them among the stalks of flax, and she arranged on the roof. The men pursued them along the road to the fords of the Jordan. As soon as they left to pursue them, the city gate was shut. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. God, we are thankful for your word. God, we're thankful for the surprising faith of Rahab. God, I pray that we also, no matter what odds are against us, would trust in you, put our faith in you. God, we're thankful you can use anyone at any place at any time for your glory, to fulfill your purposes. So we pray, Lord, for the next few moments, God, that you'd remove distractions from this place. You'd bind the enemy from here. God, I pray you'd hide me behind your cross, Lord, that your spirit would speak. God, turn our minds' attention, our hearts' affection to you and to your word. Pray your spirit would move in this place. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. So, 40 years previously, 12 spies go into the promised land. We don't get any indication that they are caught. So they were, they were good spies but they had bad faith. These two spies who go in, they're apparently not very good at their job, right? There's only two of them, and somehow there's word they get found out. So they're desperate. They run to go and to hide. Think about times when you're desperate to get out of a situation, right? You think about those different times? I saw Holly posted on social media about sometimes, you know, you and your husband just have to go hide out in the car, right? Away from the children. Just get desperate every once in a while. My oldest, Isaiah, when he was um, very, very young as a baby, he was was the epitome of a strong-willed child, okay? And he was always desperate to get what he wanted. In fact, it started when he was about six months old or so. But I can remember the first time it happened, I was actually changing his diaper. He starts screaming. He's screaming so loud and for so long, he stops breathing, he turns blue, and he passes out. I'm freaking out. I'm getting ready to call 911. My wife was like, no, let's just call the doctor. Let's see what's happening. And we call the doctor, and they're like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. I'm like, excuse me? What they say is, these sometimes with babies, they'll get so worked up as they're screaming, they forget to breathe. So their body makes them pass out so they can start breathing again. So you know what the doctor's advice was? I'm like, you go to medical school school for so many years, and the doctor said, hey, when he passes out, you just have to act like nothing has happened. Because if you pick him up and you coddle him and you love on him, it's reinforcing this bad behavior. So he passes out, you just sit there, you eat your sandwich, all right? You don't do anything. So that was it, like he was so desperate to get what he wanted, he had screamed till he made himself pass out. And then it got, man, he was just this manipulative little child. I remember we we were putting him in, we're putting him in his crib. Now you talk about sin nature, right? We were putting him in his crib, he hated being in his crib. He'd be screaming, wailing, you know, passing out, well, at, at some point, probably about 10 months old, all of a sudden we realized, man, one day we're pulling up on the monitor and he's screaming his legs between the slats of the crib. We're like, oh no, the poor kid, his leg is stuck. We go out there, we free him, we're caught, you know, we're holding him, we're loving him. Well, for multiple days in a row, his leg is getting stuck in the slats. So we pull up the monitor and we watch, and this is like 10-month-old Isaiah who scoots his body over, sticks his leg through the slats of the crib, throws himself down, and starts screaming like he's in horrible pain. We're like, yeah, gotcha, right? But he hated being in that crib. He was desperate to get out of there, would do whatever it would take 
to get our attention. Well, these spies, we realize that they are desperate. Just think about what they'd said about the occupants of Jericho. Now, Joshua sends these spies, and he says, hey, I want you to scout the entire promise. Land, but I want you to pay special attention to Jericho. We know it's this massive, fortified city. And back here in the ancient Near East, one way you'd show your dominance and your power is you'd have these really well-constructed city walls. And Jericho was a fortress. So Joshua says, I want you to go scout out all the promised land, but I want you to pay special attention to Jericho. Because this is like the first battle we're going to fight. Now know this, back in Joshua's time, you know, when you had the land of Canaan, it wasn't just one country. You had all these little cities that almost functioned as their own fiefdoms. And so you hear about the king of Jericho, what he is, he's the ruler of this city. But these spies have gone in, they show up, they're scouting out Jericho, they're not good at their jobs, they get caught. And they're caught inside Jericho, Inside these walls, remember what they talked about, these giants, these terrible people, they, they had had 10 spies that said, we'd rather hang out in the wilderness and go take them on. And these spies are caught and they're desperate and they go to Rahab. And then something incredibly surprising happens. Because Rahab, what does she do? We see that she hides these spies. This pagan Canaanite woman goes against her own king and her own people. Imagine the reward she would have received if, yep, I've got these spies, here you go, you can have them. But instead of trusting in her earthly king, there in Jericho. And she ended up getting accolades from all of her people. She instead defies the king and decides to hide these spies. God can use anyone at any place at any time for his purposes. What we see here. Right away, what just jumps off the page of chapter two of, of the book of Joshua is the fact that God is sovereign. Because God uses this pagan harlot to spare these spies. And we have this interesting story here in chapter two. We read about these spies and they're, they're hiding and then she tells them, oh no, they, they already left. Go chase after them that way. And everybody listens to them. She's apparently really convincing, Right? <clears throat> and so the guards of Jericho go searching and trying to find the spies. And in the midst of this narrative, we have a pause. And we have this speech from Rahab. One commentator, Hess, he, he notes this about Rahab's speech. He says that this is one of the longest uninterrupted statements by a woman in the biblical narrative. Here we have pagan, harlot, Rahab, and yet right here she gives this incredible confession. I want us to look at Rahab's confession this morning. I think this is really the climactic point of the story. Read it what she says. Verse eight and following. Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us. And everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. Verse 10, for we heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings, you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is in heaven above, on earth below. 
And then we see her plea. Now please swear to me by the Lord that you also show kindness to my father's family because I showed kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you'll spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all who belong to them and save us from death. Do you see just the irony in Rahab's confession? The Israelites had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they were terrified of the Canaanites. They were so afraid of the giants in the land, they said, we'd rather hang out in the desert. And Rahab is saying, we heard about what you did. We heard about the slave uprising in Egypt. Think of Egypt as like just this global power at this time. They said, we heard about that group of slaves who rose up against Pharaoh and who their God miraculously delivered. We heard about how your God parted the Red Sea. And she said, we have been panicking because of you. We heard how the Lord has given you this land. Do you see how the Israelites had been so focused on their enemy? And how big, how mean, how mighty, how powerful they were. Yet the entire time, their enemies, they weren't looking at the Israelites. The enemies were thinking about the Israelites' God. And they were terrified because of him. It's so easy for us when we go through difficult times and circumstances in our own lives, when we're caught in like the storms of this world, for us to put all of our focus on the storm and the wind and the waves and focus on all of that and forget completely about the fact that we have a God who's sovereign over the storm. And the Israelites wasted 40 years being scared when the entire time, look what it says, it says that literally she says, man, we had lost heart. Everyone's courage failed. I love one translation that says, man, man, this, our, our hearts are melting because of your God. We need to make sure that we keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. Not anything in this world. We need to focus on God who's sovereign over all of it. There's three quick things I want to point out about Rahab's confession. First we see, she starts out by focusing on the might of God. The might of God. She recounts the story of the Red Sea, of the destruction of these kings across the Jordan. One commentator says, you know, biblical faith is based on at least some knowledge or data or evidence. And so her fear, faith in God, man, it was based on this evidence. She heard about how God had miraculously delivered them. She'd heard about the might of God. And then we see she focused on the majesty of God, the supremacy of God. She says at the end of verse 11, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She says there's something different about your God compared to all the other gods. Yeah, your God is in heaven, but he's also active here on earth. He's supreme everywhere. He is majestic. And because God is like that, she wants to Give, just throw herself at his feet. And look, that's, ultimately, that's the last thing we see is we see the mercy of God. The mercy of God. When she recounts who God is and what he's done, then look what she says. She says, now please swear to us by the Lord that you'll show kindness to my family. 
Spare the lives of my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and save us from death. Commentator Dale Ralph Davis says, Genuine faith never, never rests content being convinced of the reality of God, but presses on to take refuge in God. It isn't just a matter of correct belief, but of desperate need. I love that. An understanding of God, it's not just a matter of correct belief, but of desperate need. Rahab is willing to go against her king, her people, everything that she knows in this world because she's heard about the power, the majesty, the might of the God of the Israelites. And for each and every one of us, I wonder, would we have this same confession in our own lives? Saying that no matter what is going on in our lives, that we would throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus. You know, Rahab shows up here just in Joshua chapter 2, but man, she, and she shows up three different times in the New Testament. She becomes a famous figure, especially in Jewish history. You know, if you read the Talmud or the Mishnah, as they talk about Rahab, they talk about not only her beauty, they talk about her faith. In fact, they, they say, and there, there's nothing in the Bible to, to say this, but in the Talmud and the Mishnah, they both say that Rahab ended up marrying Joshua, that she was the mother of many prophetesses and prophets and priests. Josephus, when he writes his big, long history, he mistranslates the name harlot, and he says she was just an innkeeper because he wants to give her respect and reverence. And all that stuff, that's just Jewish history. She's an incredibly important figure pointed out for her faith. More than that, you know, the New Testament gives us some insight into how incredible this woman is. Matthew 1, verse 5, you know what it says? That Rahab was the mother of Boaz. We know Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of King David. See, in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, there's only four women listed in Rahab, the pagan harlot is included in the genealogy of Christ. And hopefully that gives each and every one of us a lot of encouragement. Because no matter what you've done or where you've been, if you will simply put your faith in Jesus, he can do whatever he wants with you. And Rahab, the pagan, ends up being the great-great-grandmother of King David. And Jesus can trace his bloodline to her. It's pretty incredible. It says this in the book of Hebrews when it talks about Rahab. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. If you know anything about Hebrews chapter 11, it's called the Hall of Faith. What the writer of Hebrews does, he looks at these characters throughout all of the Bible and says, I want to highlight some of them who had incredible faith. And look what he says about Rahab. By faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. By faith, she put her life on the line and hid these spies. And because of it, we know the request that she makes to these spies get answered. It gets answered by faith. Rahab goes against her culture, 
goes against her earthly king, goes against all the people that she knows so that she might throw herself at the feet of our God. Verse 14, look at the men's response. The men answered her, we will give our lives for yours. If you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window since she lived in a house that was built into the wall of the city. Go to the hill country so the men pursuing you won't find you, she said to them. Hide there for three days until they return. Afterward, go on your way. Verse 17, the men said to her, we'll be free from this oath you made us swear unless when we enter the land, you tie this scarlet cord to the window through which you let us down. Bring your fathers, mothers, mother, brothers, and all your father's family into your house. If anyone goes out the doors of your house, his death will be his own fault. We will be innocent. But if anyone with you in the house should be harmed, his death will be our fault. And if you report our mission, we are free from this oath you made us swear. Let it be as you say, she replied, and she sent them away. After they had gone, she tied the scarlet cord to the window. Here we have what we see as further proof of a promise. You have the great W.A. Criswell, pastor of First Baptist Dallas, founder of Criswell College. Uh, one New Year's Eve, he got up before First Dallas and he preached a sermon. This sermon went on for hours and it was called The Scarlet Thread Through the Bible. And what Criswell argues is from Genesis to Revelation, there are all of these allusions, all of these things are all pointing to the fact that Jesus had to shed his blood to save us from our sins. All these things pointing to the atonement. So what Criswell argues and other scholars, they say that this thread was scarlet very purposefully. Because just like the scarlet thread was held in the window to spare Rahab and her family from death at the hand of the Israelites, so each and every one of us, if we are covered by the scarlet blood of Jesus, are saved from death and destruction. Can you imagine the scene? The walls of Jericho all come tumbling down, save for one small section of that wall. With one room, God in his sovereignty makes it where one family is spared. It's pretty incredible what God can do. And I want you to know this morning if you've never made that decision to trust in God, that you can be like Rahab, you can cry out to God for his mercy. And that scarlet thread can save you too. You can trust in Christ's finished work on the cross. It says the two, verse 22, the two men went into the hill country and stayed there three days until the pursuers had returned. They searched all along the way, but did not find them. Then the men returned, came down from the hill country, and crossed the Jordan. They went to Joshua, son of Nun, and reported everything that had happened to them. So the scouts come back to make their report. I just want you to imagine this. All right, the scouts come and make a report. Think about what a scouting report consists of, Right? So let's say next year, Ennis, right? Coach Harrell sends out some assistant coaches, says, I want you to go check out our opponent for next week, all right? You go, go watch Waxahachie play, all right? And come bring back a scouting report for me. So those coaches, they go, they watch Hatchie play. They come back and they're sitting before Coach Harrell. He says, all right, can you tell me about their schemes? 
Do they have any tendencies? What, what formations do they like to go to on third and medium or third and long? Man, do they have, do they have any, uh, what, what defense do they like to do? What, 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 are they, what are they rolling out there a lot? How often do they blitz? Man, what do you think will be most effective for us? Should we run more often? Man, should we throw some screens? What is it going to be that will help us beat Waxahachie? And imagine if these assistant coaches just went up and they said, Coach Harold, don't worry about it. We're going to win. Don't worry about it. It's going to happen, right? They say, don't even worry about it at all. He said, no, no, no. Like, give me the scouting report. That's the reason why you're there. No, no, no. It's all good. We are going to win. Look what the spies say. Verse 24. Then they told Joshua, the Lord has handed over the entire land to us. Joshua told them, go scout out the promised land, pay special attention to Jericho. I think he's wanting to know, man, are there any weaknesses in their fortification? Are there any parts of the wall that might be a little weak or torn down? Any way that we can attack from this way? This is a major military campaign. He sent the scouts out so they can understand better their enemy. And the scouts come back, and I want you to notice the difference in the report from the scouts right now to the report from the scouts 40 years prior. See, 40 years prior, the report had been completely man-focused. There's giants in the land. They're big, and they're scary, and we shouldn't go and fight them. Because if we do, we're going to lose. Because they're big and they're mean. The Israelites, being so man-focused, took their eyes off the Lord, so they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. You notice the report of these two spies? It is, it is completely God-focused. They say very succinctly, the Lord has handed over the entire land to us. They simply recount the promise that God had originally made to Abraham, that he gives again to Moses, that he gives again to Joshua, and they say, if God has said it, we believe it, we're going to take the land. And I love how they throw in. After focusing on God first, then they say, and also, just so you know, everyone who lives in the land is also panicking because of us. They say, we thought we were scared of them and this entire time. Their hearts have been melting. They've lost all their courage. They're echoing the report of Rahab, the confession of Rahab, saying, man, they're, they're all just afraid. We're going to walk in there. We're going to dominate. But it's not because of us. It's not because of any great military strategy. It's not because of any of that. The reason why we can go in and we can take this land is because, God, you have promised it. Church, whatever it is that we're walking through in this life, it's so easy for us to just be focused on the here and now and be so afraid of man and forget that we have a God who is sovereign, who's in control, who because of his power and might, and we see this pagan harlot who changes the course of history by trusting in God rather than our earthly king. How could we impact Ennis and Ellis County? How could we impact the course of history if we decided we are going to trust in God? We're going to fear God rather than fear man. I can't wait to see what God does in and through us as we live boldly for him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you so much. And we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for the faith of Rahab. And I pray, God, that we would have that same faith. I pray right now, Lord, if there's anyone in this room 
that hasn't yet thrown themselves at your mercy. God, would you stir it in their hearts even now? Let them turn to you, trust in you, confess that they need you. God, I pray that we as a church, Lord, we would not fear culture, we would not fear man. But God, we'd be strong, we'd be courageous, and we'd trust in you and we'd live for you. God, we're thankful your promises never fail. And I pray, God, that we'd live boldly for you. We love you, Lord. It's your son's name we pray.